Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the New Construction Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Anya Christianton, and I'm very excited to introduce my guest for today, Bill Bonenberger. And Bill is a founder and CEO of WB Homes. So welcome to the show, Bill. So glad you're here. Thank you, Anya. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, I look forward to our conversation over the next hour or so. Yes. So you guys, Bill and I had a chance to meet at an Essence conference and we were both on a panel. And when I heard that Bill started his own company at age of 28, I was like, oh my goodness. Tell, yeah, I must, I must have a conversation with Bill because it's such a crazy um, I mean, thinking about what I was doing at age 28, you know, and you were starting your own company. So tell us a little bit about um, your story. How did you come about starting your own building company? And um, tell us a little bit more about WB Homes and what you guys do. Sure. Um, well, first of all, let me just say uh, ignorance is bliss. And uh, <laughs> When you're 28, there's a lot more that you don't know than uh, what you do know. So um, that's really kind of a blessing for a young person to be able to start a business because they don't really fully understand all the hurdles that they're going to incur. But my background is um, I attended um, a, uh, a small college uh, called Williamson College of the Trades in media where I learned um, basically building construction, masonry, uh, you know, and uh, – and I learned literally from the ground up. And uh, when I got out of Williamson, I got an opportunity to work for Toll Brothers mm -hmm. uh, back in the early 80s uh, when they were just a large regional builder long before they went public. And I got the opportunity to um, work in many different areas, starting with estimating and purchasing. Eventually, I ran the estimating and purchasing department. And then I, um, I became um, a project manager in the field. So over a six year um, time period, I literally got an opportunity to do probably um, the two most important areas in, in home building. And uh, Toll was really an innovative company even back then. And so I got to be around some really smart people. And I, I, I was a sponge. I mean, I, I never had a problem asking questions and uh, showing them how little knowledge I, I truly had. And they were more than willing um, to, to help me. So that was my springboard, and when I was 28, um, my, um, my girlfriend, who later became my wife, she also worked there, and she worked in uh, both accounting and sales, so between the both of us, we had, um, we had a, a lot of experience, so um, at 28, I, um, I left, and I bought one lot, and um, you know, I sold that house, and with that money, I bought two more lots. And uh, you know, and I remember, uh, I remember us saying to ourselves, if you know, if we could just build, we could sell one house a month, that would be as big as we would ever want to get. And uh, and so we did that after a couple of years, maybe four years. It took us to get to twelve houses. And then I remember saying, if we could just do four houses a month. And in two, two months to five, that would be 50 and that would be unbelievable. And so, you know, and so on and so forth. And now we're doing 125 to 150 and um, we've got a full organization of, you know, almost 50 people. We do everything from our own in-house marketing and sales, uh, you know, the construction management, the land acquisition and development. So um, we've got a real um, first class uh, operation here. Yeah, and I actually had a chance to visit uh, one of your sites recently in Collegeville. I had a client that was looking, so we met with Kelly. So, and um, anytime I come through one of your homes, it's definitely you can see the level of craftsmanship, the detail. Um, it, it's always such a nice staging. You guys do a great job with your um, marketing and branding. The colors you picked, I think, really fresh and um, always pops. Congratulations, of course, because Thank I mean, you. going from like, okay, so I'm just going to quit my job and buy a lot and build this house to now, you know, running company with employees who are relying on you for, you know, their livelihoods. That's kind of like a, you've come such a long way from where you started. And you, as you say, ignorance is a bliss. So when you started off, Obviously, I guess you weren't thinking that you're going to be this big builder eventually. 
you know, what was going through your mind? Like when you left your stable nine to five job to pursue <laughs> this, like, you know, what? <laughs> that's a very good question. You know, um, entrepreneurship is, I think something, um, a lot of Americans are born with and, and maybe they just haven't had the right mentor or maybe the right opportunity or they're not in the right financial spot or, you know, where they have financial responsibilities that don't allow them to truly pursue that. I was at a point in my life where, um, you know, fortunately I had, I had done a great job for Toll Brothers and I, I felt in the back of my mind because I left on, on, on good terms that if it ever failed, I, I could go back there and they would, they would employ me. But I really wanted to, um, control my own destiny as much as a person can control their own destiny. I wanted to live and, and, and die, um, um, you know, either have success or not have it based on decisions that I made. Cause I, I felt like, um, I could do the research and, you know, I, I have a good understanding of taking the information, taking all the data and then applying my own gut instincts to it and, and making good decisions. I felt I could do that better than, um, than the average person. And I thought if I, you know, if I could get the right opportunity, um, I was going to do this. So, um, I was literally taking my, um, my, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time to, to work one Sunday morning. Um, she, she worked at a toll brother site in lower Gwinnett. And, uh, I had been thinking about this for some time and I saw a lot, a sign for a lot on the side of the road. And I, I just, um, you know, dropped her off, went back and, uh, a couple weeks later, I had it under agreement and, you know, and I was leaving and, you know, I never really, um, looked back. I, I, I just, um, jumped in with two feet and, uh, you know, to this day have, uh, have never regretted it. And, uh, and I would tell young people there, you know, there's, there's never, it's never just all good or all bad in, in any business, um, that you try and, um, get involved with, uh, whether you're, whether you're the owner or whether you're, uh, you know, a minority partner or whatever, there are really good things about owning your own business, um, like controlling your own time and, uh, you know, being responsible for yourself and no one else having any control over you. But there are also, as you, as you start to grow, there are, um, you know, other uh, things that start to bear, like you are responsible for your employees, right? And when yes. you, when you go through a recession, like the one we went through from like 2008 to 2013, um, that weighs on you very heavily because, you know, to, to, to lay someone off or to be in a situation where you are thinking that, you know, business wise, you should lay someone off, but, um, but you look at them like they're, they're your family and you say, how could I possibly do that? Um, those kind of decisions are, are tough. Um, so, you know, it's, it's never all one way or the other. I think overall, um, the pros of owning your own business far outweigh the cons and I would encourage um, anybody who's considering it to do the research necessary, find a mentor, um, you know, find an investor. Um, and that's, that's what I did. I found some investor that, that believed in me and, and invested money with me because uh, home building is a very um, cash in, intensive um, business. You know, despite you can borrow money from loans, but you still have to have a significant amount of equity. And so you got to have people today that, that believe in you and, and um, you know, so, and then, you know, it, for us, it was never really, money was not the driving force for doing it. Um, it was probably third or fourth down the list. I felt like if we did um, what we said we were going to do um, with our home buyers, if we, if we over delivered and under promised, um, then we would be probably in the exception um, in the construction industry because that's probably not the norm. It's probably the other way around where you overpromise and underdeliver. So, yes. um, and I felt that we just treated people the way we would want to be treated. Then, if we did those things, the money would follow. That would just be, um, you know, it would just be the result of doing the right thing. So that's the way we looked at it. We were never driven by money, and we also looked at. And to this day, I still. I'm amazed by the fact that um, amazed is probably not the right word. I, I would say that I am um, I'm still dumbfounded by the fact that people choose us um, to put their trust in us to, to purchase what at that time is probably the most expensive and important purchase of their life. It's where they're going to raise their family. It's, go, it's where, or they're, where they're going to retire. So 
we've always taken that trust company wide as like that is something that's sacred and we better meet up to the um, responsibility that comes with that. So, and that is uh, over, over 33 years that has just percolated down through our entire company. And uh, I would say our, um, a big part of our success is our um, attention to detail. From you know, from the top down, uh, right down to from the from the CEO and president down to the uh, construction labor on the job site, they um, understand what the expectation is, and that they understand that the change is only as strong as, as the weakest link. And if someone doesn't do their job, um, the customer is going to have less than a less than an optimal experience, and unfortunately, that's not acceptable. So, it's a uh, it's a process getting that to filter down over. But once you build that um, that mindset within the company, it just it becomes the norm, and it's just part of business. Bill, I'm curious. You you mentioned so your your goal is to over deliver and under promise. So starting from where you um, where you started in the early '80s, right? That's when the the company was founded. To now, and there's been a whole evolution of the way people purchase and the way people expect things, right? With the rise of Amazon and kind of like now on demand, I want it this way. I, I want to know exactly what I'm getting. And if it's not it, I'm not going to be happy and I want an instant response. So how have you seen this impact your business over the years? And you know what have the expectations been from your salespeople to your production staff? How are you guys kind of trying to adjust to the trends that are happening? And, you know, what, what do you see going forward? Um, How is that going to impact our business? Well, technology, um, you know, obviously plays a huge role in, in, in every business and, and especially in, in, in construction. So, you know, during the recession, when, um, you know, when a lot of companies were, were cutting costs, we, we, we obviously had to cut some staff, but we invested in technology and it, we really streamlined our entire system and allowed us to communicate with our vendors, our suppliers, our subcontractors um, much faster, much more accurately. So we are one of the few um, home builders that really, um, so I would call a semi, semi custom production, a semi custom production builder. We have our standard plans. We have uh, a number of, um, uh, in every one of our communities, we have pre-designed options, structural options that allow people to expand, to meet their lifestyle and their budget. Um, and then and we have a complete option manual that's you know like a catalog that just goes through every phase of construction. And then we also, on top of that, we will consider custom options. So mm -hmm. really, whatever the buyer, and that's a very difficult thing for a production builder to do because there's so many variables, uh, starting with the variable of, of the homeowner explaining exactly what they want to our salesperson who then has to explain it to the project manager who has to explain it to the estimator and it's got to go up the chain and then back down the chain and then ultimately built. So that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, but it's, I, I feel like it's our obligation to try whenever possible to give the buyer exactly what the buyer is looking for, assuming it's within their budget to, to do it. So mm -hmm. um, our, um, we are, as I said, extremely detailed. Um, and we document everything in our, in our change orders. I mean, we, we write them out um, as descriptive as, uh, and in layman's terms, so that any person that can, that can read the English uh, language can understand exactly what it is they're buying every time they buy a, spe a specific option. It tells them what what's changing from the standard plan, what's being added, what's, what's being deleted. Um, as far, with regards to the expectations of buyers, um, that has changed dramatically. I mean, um, gone up dramatically. What they expect, uh, and I don't think it's just in home building, I think it's in general. Right. The Google review process, I mean, if you don't, um, if you under deliver, um, then people are gonna know about it immediately. And, uh, and yet, yes, you can respond to those bad posts, but they're still, they're still on your, uh, on your report card, so to speak. So, you know, you have to be instantaneous. You have to have, um, people that are dedicated to, to service work. Um, you can't put people off. You've got to, you've got to give them what is a reasonable expectation. And so 
again, it's just a matter of, um, of doing what you say you're going to do. And that's not to say we do everything 100% right all the time. We certainly do not. Um, we make mistakes. The key, I think, is that we, when we make them, we don't argue about it. We, 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 try and, we try and fix them, and we try and fix them quickly. And, you know, one of the things that I did a long time ago with my, um, with my service manager early on, uh, he was in my office uh, saying, you know, this is a gray area. That's a gray area. You know, it's, I think it's acceptable. And, and I simply said, look, we, we can't meet, you know, every day for three hours going over these issues. So mm -hmm. I'm going to empower you to make the decisions yourself. And basically I want you to just treat the people, look at our, make sure you, you know our warranty, mm -hmm. uh, inside out, upside down. But if it's anywhere near a gray area, just do it. Just, just take care of it. Treat them like you would treat. If it's not right, think that you're dealing with your mother or your father or your brother or your sister and just do the right thing. Um, you know, if it's, if it's black and white and we're definitely right and they're wrong, then you have obviously got to stand up and, and, um, and explain it to them. But, for the most part, if it's gray, let's just err on the side of doing it. And and that was one of the very last times I met with him because that's exactly what he does. And uh, and that's kind of our policy. Yeah. So it's a, it's a right thing to do, but I'm sure sometimes it's a hard thing to do, especially when we're in an environment when it's becoming more difficult for home builders to be profitable, right? Where we, you know, they don't make more land. The land is certainly going up in um, cost. It's difficult to find land. It's very difficult to find skilled labor. Um, you know, it seems like everyone's competing for any qualified trades out there. Um, so they're demanding higher pay. And of course, um, you know, the uh, everything's going up in, in, in cost, right? With all the tariffs as well. Uh, lumber, etc. Um, so how do you manage to kind of do the right thing, yet at what cost does it come? And, uh, you know, I'm sure it's quite a balancing act. How far yeah. do you go? Doing the right thing is something I, I feel we, we, we've got to do. When margins are, are, are shrinking, which they are in our industry and probably in a lot of industries, providing less service to our home buyer is, is not one of the ways we're looking at cutting costs. So what we are doing um, is we are, um, we recently brought on a, um, a, a land acquisition person who is going, going to um, hopefully give us um, opportunities that we otherwise wouldn't have had because we hadn't had a, a person specifically dedicated to land acquisition um, prior. We are also doing a much, um, a much more thorough job of analyzing products that are out there that we are putting into our homes and making sure that the buyer is perceiving the value of that product um, as at least as much as it costs us to put in. Okay. Because, you know, if we're do, putting in a product, let's just say, uh, I don't know if your buyers are familiar with the, uh, the uh, Pex Mana Block uh, product. Are you familiar with that at all? Okay. Yep. It's uh, it's a product that I don't know. It's probably been out 15 years, and um, mm -hmm. it's a product that goes in the basement, mm -hmm. and all your water lines uh, for every one of your fixtures in your house get connected to it, um, and uh, it probably costs about 350 or 400 dollars. And it looks real nice and looks real impressive, but you know we've noticed recently that the vast majority of our competition is not using it. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're at a 350 or $400 advantage uh, over us um, in terms of costing. So we're looking at all those items and saying to ourselves, okay, you know, first of all, is this something we, we have to have in our, 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 our house? Should we have it in our house? And how do our buyers perceive the value of it? And so we are looking at, uh, would the buyer rather have that $400 uh, instead of a Pex Mana Block? Would they rather have um, granite in their master bath? Uh, vanity top would they rather have um, uh, you know nicer vanities would they rather have an upgraded range so the key is to try and make sure we're putting the products in in the house that give us the best combination of value and, and how the buyers would they rather have a, a ring doorbell okay at the front door so those yep. are the kinds of things that we're we're looking at and you know we're also um, we're looking at our um, at our, at our drawing, at our construction drawings and working with structural engineers just to make sure that we have these things designed, not over-designed, obviously designed to meet codes, 
um, but not over design because that's that's um, that's kind of something that structural engineers typically do. It might be 20% over design. The beams are a little larger than they have to be. The footings are a little larger. And if you can take those costs out of the house, um, mm -hmm. it adds up to real money. And you can either save that money to expand your margin or you can put it in into incentives or you can put it in other areas in the house which the customer might get might get more value out of. So it's it's you can't just rest on your laurels. You need to be evaluating your standard features, what your competitors are doing, what's available in the marketplace by going to trade shows and the International Builders Show, which I know you've been at and, and you've yeah. seen the products that are there. And if you're not doing that, then um, then you're going to get yourself in trouble because yeah. the margins are, are shrinking, no question. Yeah, so I love the, the line that you said that um, the cutting service is not the way to do it. And I think a lot of builders need to hear that because I think uh, customer service and expectations from our customers are going to be what separates the best from the least. And I think that that gap is going to get wider and wider over time with the rise of technology, with Google reviews and everything being out there in public. And I think customers will know very quickly how you can be expected treated by somebody just by doing a quick Google search and whether or not they're going to even bother to walk into your model. It's, so I think that that's a great model that you've adopted and that that's the good way to do it because the word of mouth travels so quickly. And, you know, especially in today's, in today's world with technology, that is a must. So how do, you, um, how do you find out what is it that customers want? Do you guys survey your customers or what's the, what's the best way to go about that? We don't, well, we, um, no, we don't, we, we survey our customers um, a year after they've, uh, 15 months after they've been in their home, um, for, not just for product, but for, you know, what they, basically it's our report card. What did they think of our sales process? What did they think of our, uh, model home, you know, what, what changes if they could do it all over again, what changes would they make? What options would they have purchased or not purchased? Or mm -hmm. What would they have liked to see included that wasn't? What do they think of our service department? And it ends with, um, would you buy another WB home um, and or refer us to family and friends? And so th th that's really the most important question on the whole Mm -hmm. With regards to product, um, we um, we have a um, we have a very inclusive um, process. Uh, we have a, a, a person who's in charge of our new product development. It includes our land acquisition team. And we have and we have people on that in this group that are probably there's probably ten of us that are everywhere from millennials to you know to me, me being the oldest. And so we get um, we get a pretty broad spectrum of opinions. And what what's amazing is um, the different level of opinions you get on any product that you're talking about. You know, someone, someone says we have to have the mana block. That would be like my project manager. We have to have it. Um, you know, my, um, the person in charge of the new product development says, I'd rather have a, um, I'd rather have a grand vanity top, as I said. And so it's, it's, there's no right answer. Um, <laughs> you know, marketing is, it's, it's a series of opinions and you want to go with the opinion that probably is going to have the broadest, um, the broadest reception, but it's, it's not like checking boxes. It, it, there's no, you know, 100% right or wrong answer as to what you put in, in the house. But you, you know, you do a lot of research. There's, there's publications, um, builder magazine, they're doing surveys all the time about new products. And, and so, um, you know, realtor, the Pennsylvania association of realtors is putting the home builders association is putting out information on, on products. So the combination of all those things and gut instinct is ultimately what we make our decision from. Yeah, and I think um, being uh, not a smaller builder, but you know that you're not a huge national right. builder, gives you an advantage where you are able to make those decisions pretty quickly. You're able to meet with your team and implement those changes very, very quickly. So I think that's yeah, a that, that that is the uh, advantage of being. Um, our size, we're we're kind of like a speedboat, um, you know, versus uh, a tanker. The downside to that is, you know, purchasing power. That the tanker has a lot more purchasing power um, and can do things that, that we can't. So, uh, but you know, it. I think in the end, I like being nimble. Being nimble allows us to control our own destiny and react faster. And uh, and I'll take that. 
Yeah. So I'd like to come back to a couple of points that you made. So one, you mentioned that early on, um, having a mentor was very important for you and for your success. And it's something that you recommend for younger people who are um, thinking about starting their own businesses or, um, you know, moving up in the world. So um, can you talk to us a little bit about who were your mentors and, you know, what are some of the best practices about, you know, kind of finding a mentor? How do you approach one? Yeah, well, you know, usually when you, when I got out of uh, um, college and I went to work for Toll Brothers, my, my mentor was, was my direct supervisor. It was a mm -hmm. guy named Ed Weber who um, was really taught me from the ground up um, the, the whole business side of, of home building. Um, you know, he taught me, um, I was like a sponge and I, since I didn't know anything, I had no bad habits that he had to break. So whatever he told me, as far as I was concerned, it was written in the Bible, and, and that's what I was doing. And uh, you know, he taught me the importance of bidding, getting three bids minimum. How you you know how you get them apples to apples to make sure you're you're ma you're making a, a, an accurate uh, decision based on all the facts. Uh, writing the contract, how when you you know when you are you know bidding something out and and uh, you prepare the spreadsheet. This is before Excel and all that. Um, that somebody uh, 10 years later should be able to open that file and understand exactly the process that I went through to make a decision on who got awarded the contract and for how much, because it would all be right there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, typically um, your boss um, is, is a good option if, if you have a good relationship with your boss, but it could be other people, uh, you know, in the, in the business. And I, I have found that most people, um, that are you know above you in authority if you are humble and um, you are not afraid to ask questions if they understand uh, and see a willing a general willingness to grow and learn and you don't act like you know stuff that you don't know are more than willing to help you uh, mm -hmm. I think it's very rare when you have somebody that is you know just downright uh, mean and unwilling to help you I, at least I've never found that and I've instructed, you know, my, you know, my kids and my employees, like, you know, don't sit in a meeting when we're talking about something and, you know, you don't understand 80% of the, of the, and we can't, we can't stop the meeting every 10 seconds to explain everything, but take some notes. And when we're done, we'll go back over it and we'll, we'll explain so that next time you understand more. And if we do that, you know, a couple of times a week for six months, you'll, you'll be where you need to be. And so, uh, but you know, mentors can come. Uh, mentors can come from any place. I mean, they can come from you know. A lot of my mentors have been people that I that I went to church with, and uh, you know, you don't need need to be just mentored in business. You you can be mentored in life, um, and I think that's equally important. And th those mentors are are everywhere. Your your friends, they could be your family. Um, you know, fathers are great fig uh, mentors. Mothers are great figures. You know, older brothers and sisters can be great mentors. Um, as long as you approach it the right way and, and, you know, you know, you're not a, a smart aleck and, and you're not a know-it-all and you make it easier to have those conversations. Uh, I think most people enjoy, most people who are mentors love being mentors because they get, they get it's like any, it's like anything else that you do. Uh, you get more out of giving than receiving mm -hmm. and, uh, you get more out of mentoring because, you know, then you, at some point you become the mentor and you remember that. and. Uh, you know, one of the things we do at um, um, one of the things that I do in addition to home building is I am the uh, chairman of the board of this small college that I went to, Williamson College of the Trades, mm -hmm. um, and it's the only school in the country that offers. Um, this will be great for your viewers to know. The only post-secondary school in the country of more than six thousand. So, you know, anything from a community college to a technical school to a university to a college the only school in the country that offers every single student accepted a full scholarship inclusive of room and board so they pay nothing and it's it's for financially deserving um young men um and you know one of the things we do there to, to promote leadership is the seniors are um are when the freshmen come in each year the seniors are assigned a freshman and that is their responsibility to mentor them in shop, on projects, around campus. And so as a, as a freshman, you learn how to take orders and you learn how to, um, um, you know, do what, do what you're told, okay? And then 
And gradually, two years later, you become a senior because we have, we, it's three year school, not a four year school. Um, you learn how to give orders, right? And you remember when you were a freshman, some of the seniors who didn't maybe not have been the kind of leaders that you wanted, that you would want to be, maybe they were too harsh, maybe they were too easy, whatever. But, um, you know, leadership is something I think that is, um, very much in need, uh, in every aspect of, of our society work. And so, um, preparing young men to be leaders is, um, uh, something I'm committed to. Yeah. So you guys definitely get out there and find a mentor if you haven't already. And like Bill said, it doesn't have to be somebody directly, um, you're connected to. So for example, a lot of my mentors are people that I've never met. Um, it's a lot of podcasters that I listen to or people that I follow their training, um, in their seminars, et cetera. So it's kind of like a distant mentor that you can listen to. Uh, but they're not necessarily sitting right next to you, but you're still learning the lessons from them. And, um, Bill, so, so many of, um, uh, people who have accomplished a lot, um, in this industry, saying the same thing that you have said is that don't be afraid to ask questions. So I think so many young people feel insecure in the way when they don't know something and they feel um, almost ashamed to ask a question or to be always asking a question. And I always say, you know, there comes a point where it's too late to ask a question. So you need to ask questions now when you feel that, okay, I'm new and I, I can actually ask those questions yeah. because if you don't and a year goes by and you still don't know the answers, now you ask a question, now you're going to look dumb, you know? So, so don't be afraid to ask questions when it's time to ask questions. That's a very good point. I've never thought of it that way, but you are, you are right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, Bill, the, the college that you've attended, um, it seems like it was specifically with emphasis on trades. Yes. Right? Um, so how do you think, um, was it an advantage or disadvantage to you as a business owner? Because obviously um, there's so many builders, I think, coming out of like almost like the opposite, like kind of like Ivy League school with like a business degree. Um, versus the trade route where, you know, you, you learn to basically build a house first and then you learn the business side of it, right? That is a great question. That is a great question, Anya. And I, I think I had um, probably the best combination. So at, at my college, I learned how to – I learned theory. I learned, uh, you know, literally from the ground up, from the footings up, how, to be, how construction worked, um, how to estimate – and things like that. When I got to um, Toll Brothers, um, what I learned there as I sat in the project management meetings that we had, uh, which are still to this day, I think, legendary, they, they uh, um, Monday, Monday evenings, um, the entire company at that point would get together and uh, we would have meetings and, and Bob Toll would be there and Bruce Toll would be there and all the project managers, many, many from Ivy League schools. And, you know, we would talk about, we would spend a lot of time talking about marketing and you know what i learned is that um if if i could only have the business side or the construction side i think the business side is more important mm -hmm. um i was lucky enough to come with with the construction side already intact at least the basics of it mm -hmm. um but what, you know what i learned is that home building is is it's, it's all about marketing marketing your product mm -hmm. um and um you know and so um, that's, you know, that's what I learned. And, and uh, I learned, we learned how to um, put together a model home and, and not, you know, marketing is not something today in this, in this day and age where you can afford not to be state of the art. Your model homes have to be crisp. They, your, your floor plans, they have to be um, state of the art. They've got to be open. I mean, you've got to have all the bells and whistles that the market demands or otherwise they're going to buy from your competitors because I will tell you all the nationals are going to have it. They're, you know, they don't have a, a, a tight a budget to work with. So mm -hmm. as a small regional or regional builder, you have, you have to pay attention to that, um, to marketing your house. It is the single most important aspect of the home building business. Yes. You need to know the business side. Yes. You need to know the construction side. Um, but you need to understand how to market it, um, and how to position it in the marketplace so that when that buyer, 
And depending on what product you know you are are selling, a lot of the product we sell is not an absolute must for the buyer. It's more of a lifestyle choice. You know, if you're you know 50 years old and your your kids are just about or they're out of the house. Your, your house is perfectly fine, but you know, you might want to get rid of that house because you want to play more golf. You want to, you want to vacation more and you don't, you don't want that big house and you don't want the outside maintenance. So you need to have your product positioned so that when the instant they walk in the door, there is an emotional attachment and they can see themselves living there. So I would say the single most important thing I learned, um, you know, at Toll Brothers was the importance of marketing. And that really has, um, you know, I'd say been one of the major keys to our success. Yes, definitely. Marketing is the key. And I think if you can market, then any industry, anything you do, you're going to be successful because it's, it's all about selling and how to position yourself, right? Whether it's even, even a, finding a spouse, right? You got to market yourself yeah. or in business. So it's all about marketing. And speaking of technology, you know, you, you brought up an, uh, an important point before that, um, during a downturn when everyone was kind of like um, holding on to, to everything they've got, you've actually invested money in technology. And so I think equally as important as having a great model home, because obviously when people walk through your model home, that's what's going to sell the home itself, right? Is, I mean, yep. you can have a great salesperson, but if they're selling out of the trailer, it becomes that much more difficult than selling a model. And having a website, right? Because if you think about um, so many builders out there and how this industry is still behind with technology, like, you know, when you look at the reports from NHB um, and uh, Realtor Association, they all say that vast majority of buyers start their search online. So, you know, when builders think about, okay, well, it's you know, it's not an unheard of thing to spend 500K plus on a model home, but what about your website? You know, they're like, oh, I don't want to spend any money on the website. Well, your website is like your model home, right? Because that's the first impression that somebody's going to see and that's what's going to determine whether or not they actually take that next step and see that actual model home next. So yeah, to your point, marketing is so key and having a great model home and great website is so important these days. Uh, absolutely. You can't have one without the other. And, and I would, I would say that, um, yeah, people absolutely start on the website and they may be, and we, you know, with technology today, you can tell how, how often someone's on your website. You can tell exactly what they've been looking at mm -hmm. while on your website. Um, and so, um, yeah, if your web website doesn't capture them, you're never going to get them to your model, model home. So I would say, you know, that's probably your, your primary, Point of contact but yeah once once you get them to the model home you'll lose them pretty quickly if your product is outdated you know you, you got to have the right color schemes the right material the right fabric the right hardwood um it's uh it's uh my daughter came into uh the business uh from um the fashion industry after five years in the fashion industry she was a project manager for um for several um um uh you know abercrombie for one um and um, so, you know, in, the, in that line of business, it's all about marketing as well and, 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 you know, choosing the right patterns and the right material and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, when she came on board uh, two years ago, she was absolutely amazed at the number of moving pieces that it takes to run a successful home building company. Um, it's not just uh, hey, if I if I know how to build a house, I can be a builder. It's it's it's. It's uh, that's not a good recipe for success. No, absolutely not. And uh, yeah, so to um, to your point and to to give you credit for your model home, I was definitely blown away last time I visited your model home and uh, we went down to design center in the basement and uh, all the color palettes. Uh, my customers were very, very pleasantly surprised by the choices. So it was uh, right on. So whoever's doing your designs, you guys are you guys are definitely doing a great job. And um, Bill, to wrap this up, so, um, you know, obviously one of the biggest challenges that the home building industry right now is facing is shortage of skilled labor. We've talked a little bit about that already. And so to give a plug to your, uh, your cause and your college, 
um, you know, when somebody's thinking about choosing kind of a traditional four year university versus going into trades, um, you know, what are some of the things that you would give them to think about as far as time investment, money investment, and then the end result, like what you can expect when you come out of school? Um, obviously, it worked out really well for you. Um, so yeah. you know, maybe. Yeah. Well, I, I think, you know, I think, uh, unfortunately, you know, young people have been um, programmed to believe that the only option for success is, is college. And college is a great option for success for a lot of people. And I think it's, I think it's especially true for, if you, if you have a, an, an indication of what it is you want to do, if you, you know, and I would say like specialty related, I want to be an engineer, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a lawyer, I want to, I want to be, um, you know, something like that versus I'm just going to go and take general courses and, uh, you know, and, and have a very um, general education that doesn't really prepare me to do anything um, specifically. You know, what we find at, at our school and uh, is that it's a lot of people who are not that intrigued about, you know, typical, typ a typical um, educational experience at college. They're, 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 they're more interested in nuts and bolts and, me and mechanical things. And, um, and so they want to pursue that. And um, I will tell you this, for as long as we have been uh, educating um, students at our school, um, we've had a hundred, a hundred percent placement. And these, um, these young men are starting at salaries that would blow your, blow your mind far above what the average, um, college graduate is getting and they're, and they're graduating with four and five and six offers. And so, you know, it's not the right answer for everybody, but, um, it's, it, I, sh I would just encourage people that if, if you don't think a typical four year college, it feels right then you should, you should look into, there's all kinds of technical schools, um, uh, you know, tech schools where, you know, cybersecurity, it doesn't need to be a conventional for your college. And you're going to find that they're typically more affordable. You know, in, in our case, it's, it's completely free, uh, providing uh, that there's a, a demonstrated financial need. So, um, you know, when you get out of college, um, the other thing that I think you, you, you gain um, from a technical experience is a, is a confidence and a self-awareness that I don't see in the typical for your college graduate. Okay. They are, you know, young, young people that have a trade or specialty are much more confident about the world and their future and their place in it. Um, because that skill is portable. You can take it anywhere and, uh, and it's in demand and, and, you know, there's less and less, there's more and more of a need for technical, technically trained people each year and because people aren't going into it. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's a great opportunity for those who are willing to, you know, take the time to look into it. So if somebody wanted to apply to, um, to scholarship to the college, what's the, is there a website or what's the name yep. of the college again? It's called, uh, Williamson College of the Trades and it's williamson.edu and, uh, you'll see the website and there are six, specific trade programs that we offer and uh, it's uh, it's been around since 1888 so it's tried true and tested and uh, and we don't just uh, teach people to be good technicians we, we teach them to be good leaders and, and good members of society that's really our goal awesome so I'll link that to the show notes if you guys want to check out or you have uh, brothers or sisters I guess not sisters. So what's up with that? You know, because the one well, thing you know that's it's, it's uh, that's what our that's that's what the family, yeah, we would love to have an all girls Williamson as well. And if we could raise the money to do it, we would. But um, uh, in our deed of trust, it says uh, male, um, all male, because uh, you know I think there's a, there's a lot of studies out there that uh, say that single sex education is 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 better in terms of you stay more focused, uh, you don't have the distractions and. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, but we have nothing against young women in the trades either. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. So in fact, I think that's definitely a great avenue for a lot of women to get into. Absolutely. We have, we have women on our, we, money. we have more women on our job site than, uh, than I could possibly imagine. I mean, most of our electricians are women. It's, it's, and they are, they are great workers. I mean, they're, they're every bit as good or better than the men. So yeah, uh, it is construction is not just for men. Yes, and hopefully more and more women realize that. And um, I think as we are um, having those conversations and we, 
we have more women going into the trades and young women can see these role models and can picture themselves in that position, it's going to happen more and more so because it's about time, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Well, Bill, thank you so much for being on today. I really appreciate your sharing your insight and um, your, your story. I mean, it's such an inspiration, I think, for anybody thinking about um, you know, starting their own business or taking that leap of faith that, you know, you don't have to have every single thing figured out. Like you said, start with one, see how it goes. And then hopefully you can get to one a month and then four a month. Right. And that's, that's kind of how it goes. So, yep. and, uh, Bill, so are you going to be attending the international builder show this year? Actually this year, uh, we will not, um, I will not, we will be sending people, but, uh, I was there, uh, last year and I try and go like every, every other year, but we will have people there. Yes. Great. Awesome. And so if you guys haven't already registered for the international builder show, definitely check it out. It's a great opportunity to meet a lot of like-minded individuals, your peers, and, uh, really see what's going on. What are the trends in the industry? So, um, Bill, I hope to see you very soon again. And it's been a pleasure to have you on. Likewise, and it was an honor to be on. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.